Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. If you like small cap investing, you'll love this episode. At Risk Australia, our team considers around 45 different factors or metrics in our initial filter on companies. That is, before we actually start our deeper research. But we're not the only ones who use subtle or explicit checklists and filtering systems to allocate our time and capital better. In this episode, I'm joined by heavyweights in the small cap investing universe, Mark Tobin, founder of Coffee Microcaps, and Andrew Page, founder of strawman.com. The three of us share three of our favorite factors to consider when identifying smaller companies to research. We even include some examples to go along with those factors. So there are plenty of companies, tidbits, and good anecdotes for you to take away from this episode. As always, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. Andrew Page from Strawman, Mark Tobin from Coffee Microcaps. It's great to have you on the show. Andrew, thanks for coming back. I feel like this is your third or fourth time on the show. Yeah, you can't get rid of me, mate. I'm just, I'm a bad smell that just hangs around. Thank, thanks for having me back. <laughs> no, no worries, man. It's uh, my pleasure. And, and Mark, uh, second time on the show, but many of the listeners will be familiar with you and Coffee Microcaps. It's pretty early where you are, right? Uh, yeah, pretty early, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of w- well used to it now. And uh, it's great to be back on with uh, Andrew and yourself. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this chat. Yeah, cool. So what we've got for uh, for listeners is just a bit of a catch up on how you guys are going and then maybe three points or just some companies and ideas for how we look at micro cap and small cap companies, uh, primarily in Australia. Um, bit of a disclaimer before we get to this, um, as people will know, many people will know, we talk about small caps and we talk about investing in them. If you don't know what you're doing, it can be a bit of a minefield. This episode is about hopefully just giving you some wisdom and, and some ideas for going about scrutinizing your own small caps and small businesses. Um, but it's definitely not, you know, this isn't the silver bullet. So there's more to it than what we're going to talk about. But with that disclaimer said and done, maybe Andrew, we were just chatting off air and we didn't actually get to you. How's straw man going? It seems like everything is just flying, mate, which is great to see. Yeah. I mean, the, the hard thing with, um, I guess a social platform is that there's there's sort of two hurdles. One is one is the technology, and I, I vastly underestimated what's <laughs> involved in building a platform. Um, but we've passed that. You know, everything's working really, really well. But but even you know, you can have the best technology in the world if there's no one on there. It's useless, as as Google found out when they tried to go up against uh, uh, Facebook. So. Um, we're really excited. Probably things have been growing steadily, but last year, mid last year, we really hit an inflection point where just the, the, not just the level of user growth really accelerated, but the volume of content really accelerated as well. So there's, there's this nexus that you pass. It's like if you're a contributor or someone who likes to post and share your thoughts, you're not going to do it if no one's listening, right? So once you, once you pass that critical mass, it's really, we've just hit this flywheel. So yeah, we're really excited. I mean, we're at 17, 18,000 uh, users at this point in wow. time. And we probably have about, yeah, two thirds of them at least as monthly active users as well. And um, touch wood, so far, the straw man index, which just measures the average performance of, of everyone, is just knocking the lights out. It's, if anything, it's probably a bit too good. Yeah. It doesn't seem, yeah. it doesn't seem uh, realistic. But so, yeah, everything's really great. And we've got some really big, um, uh, exciting news in the works. I don't want to sort of show my hand at this stage, but uh, it's going to be a pretty exciting year. Yeah, man. Uh, that's great. I, I know, know you, knowing you personally, I know it's how hard it's been at times, you know. It's been a journey. Yeah. It's been a yeah, journey. But you've got yeah. like, you've got well, on the tech side of things, you've got some like dev resources now that are really helping you hit your stride, right? Oh man. Look, developers are like marketers, you know, they're everywhere and yet finding really good ones is is like a needle in a haystack. So, you know, you heard the same, all of us have, you know, when you sort of start off a business, it's like, oh, it's really important to get good people. And you sort of nod your head and go, well, yeah, of course, of course, I wouldn't want to get bad people. Um, 
But then you sort of learn that lesson firsthand, and a lot of the a lot of the time you don't really know until you sort of trial. Mm. And so, so it is it is it is a real journey. But that is that is another thing I'm super excited about. Now we've got a couple of developers involved who are able to give us a lot more of their time, and they're very 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 competent people. So, yeah, it's, uh, all going well. Cool. Yeah, I um I know a lot of people that follow Strawman and have accounts and and post regularly. They're like. I can't wait for Andrew to bring out things like analytics on the back end from all the numbers and from all the, the insights that the community is bringing. I think that's like a powerful force because it's very hard to do that at scale, like from a programming, from yeah. a, a development point of view, bringing qualitative information into a centralized platform and actually doing something useful with it. It's challenging, but if you can, and I think Strawman's probably the only platform that can, um, it's going to be a huge resource. Even for analysts like myself or Mark, Having a resource where you can go to get scuttlebutts is really, really valuable. Um, yeah. Speaking of, Mark, we just chatted off air. I know it's 1 a.m. where you are or just after, a fair bit after. Um, you just jumped off a call uh, for Coffee Microcaps. Um, f- maybe for those people who don't know what you're doing, can you just explain what Coffee Microcaps is and, and how it's going? Yeah, so I guess uh, Coffee Microcaps is a financial media and, a, and events company where we try and shine a light on what I call industrial microcaps uh, listed on the ASX. So that's kind of anything outside of the like junior resources space, uh, biotechnology space. So you know, every other sector then is just kind of in that kind of catch-all industrial um, cohort, I guess. So, you know, it's you know, microcap technology companies, microcap media, finance, hardcore industrial products businesses, you know, right, right across the the industrial spectrum. And, you know, it's I, I define a microcap anything under 300 million. There's varying definitions. If you look at the kind of fund managers in Australia who operate in the space, some will say it's 300, some will say it's 500, some will say it's anything outside the ASX 200, some will say it's outside the 300. You know, there's, a, there's no really hard and fast rule. In the US, you know, the hard and fast rule is 300 million. You know, there's no, you can talk to any US white cap investor, they'll all tell you the same, the same benchmark. And yeah, we used to do in-person conferences when that was the thing pre-COVID. Uh, don't do those currently, but hopefully the back end of this year, I'm really hoping we can, <laughs> you know, get the community back together because our last event in Sydney, which uh, Andrew was at, you know, the, the the best part of the whole event for me was like the networking drinks afterwards, because that is one of the things I'm trying to get going here. A bit mm-hmm. like what Andrew's trying to do. It's a community of like micro cap investors who can, you know, meet up regularly and, and, and share and, you know, kind of coalesce everything of, you know, they're looking at stuff, they're engaging with the event and, you know, it's it's time to catch up in person because we do so much now over email and Twitter. Or whatever. I mean, if I give you an example, like our Slack group that I'm on, you know, we had guys from Brisbane down, we had guys from Melbourne up. I was there internationally and actually two, two, two of our Slack group members came from Adelaide for my last event in Sydney. And, you know, we have a photo of us all together. And that was the first time we met in person after some of them, we probably talked to each other over Slack for about four years and never met in person. So uh, that's not happening mm-hmm. now. Um, so we switched to doing online events. And I didn't want to try and just, you know, replicate doing an in-person conference and everybody sit in front of their computer for eight hours. So we're doing um, morning meetings kind of every second Thursday. 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. where we get just two companies in to present over the hour, kind of a 20-minute prezzo, 10-minute Q&A. And again, it's kind of focused in that, in that niche, under 300 million industrial microcaps. Um, and yeah, we just finished up the 26th one um, this morning. I've got a, probably another one coming on next week. I'm just waiting for one of the companies to confirm. And yeah, the microcap audience continues to grow. I, I think the last time we were on, on together, I said I was just about to tip over a thousand on Twitter, and you gave me a, a little shout out and boosted it over the thousand. Uh, you know, n- now it's heading to two thousand seven hundred followers on mm-hmm. on Twitter. You know, YouTube are up to nearly six hundred followers. Um, so you know, it, it, a bit like Andrews, I think you know, over the course of twenty twenty, while there was a lot of setbacks on the. I guess what I wanted to do in in terms of the conferences, um, you know, move it down to Melbourne. I wanted to do, you know, an event in Melbourne as one of my key goals, which kind mm. of totally fell out the window. Um, you know, on the virtual side or the the online side, 
you know, seen really steady growth. And, uh, you know, this I just checked my numbers there now. You know, March was a record number for new followers on the Twitter account for me. So it's, it's also, I think, kind of past some kind of inflection point, I think, as well. So, yeah, excited about what's to come in 2021. Mm, for sure. Yeah, I've got to admit, like, our whole team subscribes to the Coffee Micro Caps uh, newsletter and we we watch the updates and, and what have you. And between both of the resources, right? Like I know in, in, their, in your own way, you're both disruptive in what you're doing. But um, as some like an analyst myself and our team, it's so valuable to have the insights of private investors and to be able to speak to company management because it's, it's often very hard, right, Mark, that you would have access to smaller, even smaller management. I mean, in Australia, it's a bit better, but it's still not easy for just a single investor to go out and speak with someone for half an hour, right? Yeah, I mean, I've said this before. Sometimes it's even hard as an institutional investor to get uh, access to management. I mean, I used to work at Wilson Asset Management in Sydney, and you know, sometimes you will just get those management teams who are hyper focused on executing, um, and you know, just want to you know let the numbers speak for themselves, and and they'll never take a meeting, or very rarely, you know, you got to try and catch them at the AGM, or they might, you know, do a call one call after you know results come out in in february and august and that'll be it so um i would say uh, access to management is probably a bit easier mm. down the micro cap end if you're a, a, a private investor because you know they're not getting a, the volume of calls um that you would get you know even up in the small cap end or, or definitely in the mid cap end from um, you know, institutional fund managers. Now, there are institutional managers working in Australia, but Owen, it's such a large universe that you just, you just can't cover it all. Um, and I think that's where, mm-hmm. you know, Strawman with, with Andrew is a great resource. And I, I'll, you know, anybody I've, I, I kind of talk to who's, you know, coming to look at the Australian market for the first time or, you know, getting into microcap investing for the first time, you know, I, I definitely point him to Strawman as like a great resource to, you know, just build up that historical knowledge base or, or you know, get a different viewpoint on, you know, you've looked at a company, you know, what are other people uh, thinking about it? And, you know, you can get lots of different opinions mm. and some great insights as well, because that's the other good thing about, um, mm. you know, the microcap universe, whether it be on Twitter with me or with, with, with Strawman and Andrew, um, you know, these private investors, some of them have like really relevant industry knowledge that, you know, there's no way you could have such an insight totally, into, yeah. into a business. But yet, you know, you throw it out there on Twitter, or you, you scroll through on um, on Andrew's uh, site and you find, you know, really deep insider, inside the industry, I mean, not insider information, but the inside the industry dynamics that, you know, you, you'll never glean from a, a mm. company presentation or their website um which i think is like really valuable and it's it's definitely um i guess a disruptive force for good mm, totally uh, one of the things i had a uh, i was trying to do some research on a company or our team was uh late in 2020 and what we try and do is when we do our research we record an interview with the, the management team and share that with our investors and um we were really keen on this small company. It was like 30 mil market cap. So very small. And I reached out and said, Hey, look, you know, this is our investor base. This is what we're looking to do. We really like the company. Do you want to have a, have a chat for 10 or 20 minutes as far as zoom? Tell us a little bit about your company and a little about yourself. And my response that I got was we don't chat to investment clubs. And that was the end of the conversation. And I was like, that's really disappointing, right? Because there's a good story to tell behind this business and we have the opportunity for you to do it. Um, and you don't want to do it and it's a shame Um, but you do come up against it I'd say most of the you know decent companies actually want to engage with their shareholders and um, when you can get those insights it's pretty special I think I think just on that point yeah I mean uh, to me like investor relations is like absolutely critical in the micro cap space I've said this numerous times Um, you know people will buy a large cap people will buy apple you know they just I, I if they're going to start investing, you know, without even doing too much research, they'll buy Apple or they'll buy CSL if we can to take a, you know, uh, an Australian example. But, you know, you as the management team, you know, you got to sell them a micro cap or a small cap. 
you know, you, you got to really convey that message, to convince people to like I- invest in your company. And, you know, to me, it's one of the hallmarks of actually how you can assess management is, you know, are they doing a good job on the investor relations side? Because it's critical to unlocking the the value that's within the within the company. You know, I think poor IR can cost you like a couple of PE points. Um, and, you know, that ultimately feeds into your cost of capital because your script, you know, is, you know, less value. So if you want to do acquisitions via script, you, you know, you, you're not getting the, you're not getting the benefit of, of that. So, you know, if, mm-hmm. if you're trying to engage with a company and they're very poor at getting back to you, even if you tell them you're a shareholder, you know, they don't come back to you or, you know, they don't engage as, as you say now. I mean, they got to weigh up, you know, how big a shareholder are you, you know, wh- wh- what's the context in it. But like, you know, as you say, most good management teams, you know, really engage with shareholders, both potential and existing. Um, and the same goes with when they announce their results, you know, how how are their presentations? You know, are they trying to give you a good overview of the company, you know, where they're at, the context of the operating environment, uh, or are they literally just putting out, Here's the financial statements and, you know, two or three paragraphs of an overview of the operations. Mm. And, you know, to be honest with you, it's hard other than looking at the raw numbers to really get a sense of how they're traveling. So, yeah, I think IR is crucial. Mm. And actually how they actually do it is an indication of management's quality, in my opinion, in the microcap space. Uh, Because it it signals their incentives too, right? Like what's you can understand them a bit better when they actually engage with you proactively. Um, okay, guys. So now we'll we'll do a bit of a chat and we'll talk about some metrics or checklist items that we look for when we're um, trying to identify really good small cap companies to invest in. Um, I've got a list of three. You know, Andrew's got a list of three. Mark, you're probably just going to just do this ad lib and, and, and awesome. Mm-hmm. It's going to be great. Um, so why don't we just start off? We'll do a bit of a rapid fire, if you like, of three things that we, we look for each. Maybe I'll go first. I'll be selfish and go first. And I'm going to talk about um, a lot of small cap companies. Uh, Mark, you mentioned this before when you talked about the, the cost of capital and equity. Um, a lot of companies um, need capital to make acquisitions. And that acquisition obviously brings with it revenue. And this is of, often important for small companies because they need uh, they need to bolt on services or products to their initial core offering to really have a good value prop. And so um, what I'm looking for with a lot of the small caps that I look at is that organic revenue growth and distinguishing between the two. Sometimes that's not easy with small caps, but I think for me, it's like a key signal that the value prop is there in the business. And so this is kind of matching the the fundamentals to me as an investor in smaller companies, that growth focus. I'll just give one example, which is a company called SkyFi, trades on the ASX under the ticker code. SKF, you guys might know it. Um, the company creates um, like omni data intelligence, is what they call it. It's that like you go into a shopping mall and it tracks your movements uh, based on Wi Fi signals and cameras and stuff like that. And it gives analytics and data to the shopping center or mall or stadium or whatever it might be um, about the people inside the building. Um, the business has made a few acquisitions, one every year for the past three years by my count, which makes it hard to discern organic revenue growth from acquired revenue growth seems to be growing quickly but um i think this is like a for small cap investors understanding what is the actual organic growth is a key one for me yeah i think um j- just on your point on and uh under under revenue growth i mean it, it, revenue is one thing but you know one of the things i find especially in uh in micro caps is you know it's very easy to grow revenue and you know you can make you know, very sexy presentations that we've done compound annual revenue growth of 40, 50% a year for the last mm-hmm. four or five years. But is it profitable? That's the thing. You know, if if you raise, you know, $10 million and you like throw $10 million at marketing and business development, hiring salespeople and this, that and the other, um, you know, it's very it's probably easy to grow revenue. But, you know, where how is that translating into operating leverage like a bit further down the business? Uh, and there is a bit of in mm. the micro cap and small cap space. There is a bit of investing for growth. You know, you've you got this upfront cost, um, but you know the the revenue mightn't be you know immediately kind of coming through, or might, you know there might be a bit of a lag. But that's one thing to watch out for. You know, mm. I see a lot of presentations from companies where you know the, on the very top line it looks great, but the minute you start like looking down, you're like, well. 
you know, revenue, classic one, you know, revenue is up by a million and, you know, in, in the last like quarter, but like marketing spend is up like 1.2 million. So, you know, they've spent 1.2 million to gain like a million dollars worth of revenue. And like, you know, that's a classic one that, you know, I think a lot of inexperienced, you know, investors in this space get caught on is, you know, the, the the headline number and, you know, what the companies promote kind of takes over from, um, well, actually, you know, wh- how is this revenue starting to generate operating leverage and improve margins? So, you know, I, I tend to, you know, look at revenue, but also look at like, the, you know, the cash flows then. And, you know, you can have up and down quarters and I try to look at like, you know, when I look at the quarterlies that are going to be coming out now, the appendix four C's through the, you know, the back end of April, you know, what has been the year over year cash flow growth number? Like that's a really key number for me to look mm. at because, you know, quarter on quarter can be a bit lumpy and, you know, some things come in just after the end of the quarter, the month or whatever. But that year on year number, you know, if that's not increasing, you know, then I start to get worried um, because, you know, over the course of a year, you know, you should be able to see the effect of the efforts of, um, you know, the management team and spending money on marketing and business development. And, you know, these salespeople should be proving themselves and, you know, all of that. So I, I think on that revenue one, you know, you, you've got to be a little bit more, um, I guess, strategic about how you look at it. I, yeah, I, I, totally. you got to pair that with other things. Yeah, yeah, I, I strongly ahead, agree yeah. with with what both you guys are saying. Um, so I won't I won't repeat them. A, a couple of little um, considerations when you're dealing with a lot of small companies too. You see these very big headline numbers as well. So it might be we've got eighty percent revenue growth, which is great. But then often for these companies, they're 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 off they're working off an extremely small base. So if they've only like you know started monetizing their product or they've moved into a new area, it looks really great. But it's like well. That 400% revenue growth that you experienced was off you guys earning $100,000 last year. It's not, you know, you can't, you can't mm-hmm. compound out at that rate. So you do have, to, and you always, I think anyone who's in business knows this, that you often get a lot of the low hanging fruit first. So it's all good stuff to look at, but you just got to be careful with extrapolating some of those very high rates of growth going forward, particularly when it is off a small base. Um, and one wrinkle, just to sort of play a bit on what uh, Mark was saying there before, What's really hard in this new um, era, I guess, of, of tech-oriented business models is that it's actually not dumb to spend more money than you're bringing in if, and this, this is the big if, if it is it is uh, going to get a decent ROI over the long term. So the classic example that everyone talks about here is Amazon, whose revenues were just growing and growing and growing and growing. It just never made any kind of profit because their costs just kept on going up. Well, in the fullness of time, that was an extremely savvy move because they just stitched up the entire market and now they're able to flex that pricing model. So it's it's not always a bad idea, but unfortunately, and this is, I think, what what you're getting at, Mark, is that it can be used as, as, uh, as a little bit of cover. So there's plenty of other examples, in fact, more examples of companies who, despite strong revenue growth, that cost base keeps growing and growing and growing, but probably not with the adequate ROI and long-term strategic value that, that such a move would require so you do have to be very careful totally understanding that relationship between lifetime value and um the acquisition cost is is crucial and sometimes you know you gotta you gotta spend money to make money andrew um mark talked about cash flow year over year talked about um knowing the difference between organic and acquired revenue um how about you? What would be something that you're looking at when you're taking a look at small cap companies? Yeah, I think um, one of the, the first things I look at is the balance sheet strength and the cash burn. So uh, not not to generalize here, but I, I would say is a, a pretty substantial number of companies under that classification that are, that are pre-profit. That's fine. That's just the stage of business that they are at. But um, what you will find is, is that as they burn through that cash, they well, they eventually run out of it, even if the business is overall going going well. Um, so, so they need to either borrow money um, or they need to issue more shares. And it seems, and we've seen a lot of this lately, a lot of companies raising uh, cash, which is good and not a bad thing, by the way. Um, uh, th- this can be a wonderful thing, again, if they can get a decent return on, on the cash 
uh, that they raise. But it does mean that you potentially suffer a lot of dilution here. So we were having a bit of a joke about uh, mm. Catapult, sort of this uh, toxic uh, girlfriend I, I have who who have this love-hate <laughs> relationship with. And so they're, they're a great example of what we've been talking about. So their top-line growth has been 20% plus for like ages. Um, it's phenomenal. But you know that that loss has widened uh, over that period. Moreover, to my point, shares on issue have grown sixty percent in five years. So to flip that around, roughly speaking, you own forty percent less of the company than you did. So it's this it's this situation where revenues up ten x in the last five years, but the per share sales have only grown five x, and the EP the earnings per share loss has doubled. So these are all very important nuances to look. Yes, top line growth is phenomenal, but it's all got to, everything else has to fit after that. Otherwise, you, you you can have a very poor outcome as an investor. So kind of optionality, right? Yeah. yeah. And if I can just come in on the, on the back of that, well, firstly, whenever the next Coffee Microcaps conference happens, Andrew, we're going to have an intervention for you <laughs> and, and, and category. <laughs> But, but just to follow on, on on the revenue thing and what Andrew is saying about these like you know big headline uh, percentage numbers, you know one of the things I look at is getting back to cash flow is you know uh, on the balance sheet and, and the cash burn is you know trying to find companies that are approaching cash flow break even and I kind of say you know are they going to kind of break even on a cash flow basis and be able to fund their own growth by and large you know in the next twelve to eighteen months. Because I find a lot of institutional investors, you know, once they kind of get over that hurdle, you know, for them, you know, the kind of business model is proven and, you know, they're happy to kind of come in and invest. It's like one of the little advantages that like private investors have. But, you know, where it goes wrong is exactly what Andrew is saying. You know, they, you know, revenue is up 400 percent. But, you know, if they only had. 100,000 in the prior year and more importantly then you you look down the P&L and you look at the cost base and the cost base is like four or five million bucks between marketing and um, you know employee costs and board costs and listing fees and all that I mean you know they're years away from just getting over the current cost base and that's with no kind of uh, increase in the cost base as the revenue base grows Mm. so you know, that's another, I think it's a good point by Andrew, you know, these big percentage numbers in revenue, well, you know, just quickly look down and see, well, how much are they going to have to grow to just even hurdle the current cost base, let alone what the cost base is going to grow to as revenue grows. Mm. Yeah. And you see that like some some companies, there's probably an argument to be made that they they shouldn't be on the, the ASX or listed at all. They should be private companies because they're so far away. Um, one of my points, which is related to this, is um, which is kind of balance sheet strength, but I guess it's just about presentation as well, um, is actually just having clean and reliable financials. So um, I think it's a sign of a management team, like a high quality management team, when they give you, the investor, um, something to go on and they are consistent with reporting. So there are numerous instances I could bring up where companies have a metric, say it's like user growth, if it's a technology or a platform company. Um, and then the next period, they're gone. They've just the, that metric has just vanished into thin air. And there's questions you have to ask, like, well, why? And it's normally a pretty cynical answer to that question. And so, a, a good example is a company called Erode, which is um, like initially a, a, a Kiwi company based out of New Zealand, um, now growing in the US, a little bit of a business in Australia. Um, we were chatting yesterday internally about the business. Um, and it just presents all the data points that you want and it does it in a clear and consistent way. And I think that's a sign that management take their relationship with the shareholders seriously. And um, I just like to see that because if you see things like grants or um, you know JobKeeper payments during COVID, et cetera, that aren't separately disclosed, it can be very hard to know what is actually cash flow and what is not, what is reliable. And, and you know, for example, is the is the, the cash flow or is the profit or revenue per user or per customer actually growing over time, mm. which is a strong sign of a business being able to cross-sell and add value to the customers over time. So, yeah, that's one for me. It's just clean and reliable financials. It it's, sounds simple, but um, it makes your life easy. I 100% agree, Owen. And um, I'm glad. I'm going to say, glad you mentioned Eroad too. So full disclosure, I am a shareholder and I, I really like uh, that company. 
but uh, yeah, they they definitely have some really nice financials, and that is that is a that is always a, a nice healthy sign. And some sometimes you have to do some adjustments your, yourself with a lot of these things. I think one particular area of, of focus for people is looking at depreciation and amortization charges, uh, which obviously get excluded from the oft quoted mm. EBITDA, um, uh, and and there can be vast differences in companies that report these wonderful EBITDA sort of stories, but at the net profit line is very, very, very different. So yeah, a lovely clean set of accounts with proper attribution of different things with a, a bias towards conservatism is a big, big tick for my money. Yeah, I mean, just to follow on the back of that point, then maybe I'll come in with uh, one that's slightly related to yours. But on that, you know, key metrics or whatever, I mean, even internally, you would think that, you know, the key performance indicators for, you know, management, frontline management, staff or whatever, you know, uh, in their own incentive structures internally should be aligned to the long-term strategy of the company. You know, if, you, if you've got, you know, if the key performance indicators for people's roles aren't to drive the long-term strategy, then, you know, their incentive structure is all wrong. And, you know, the same then comes through with the financials, you know, these key performance indicators that we get on a six-month basis or if they're an Appendix 4C company, you know, on, on every quarter, you know, they should be indicating that we're heading towards you know, the long-term strategy on a three to five-year basis, which, you know, most companies kind of say out, you know, you see lots of slides of, you know, we're here, this is where we want to get to, you know, there's a lovely like waterfall chart or, or whatever. So, you know, when these things disappear or mm. change or whatever, you know, it, 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 it is definitely a warning sign. Um, one of the things I kind of came up with, um, and I've got a, you know, an example of it, you know, I love to see businesses which, can either initially or over time, you know, sell multiple products to their existing customers because it's so hard to get customers. You know, if you can sell them extra bit and get an extra piece of their wallet, um, you know, I think that's like so much easier than just like trying to, you know, acquire new customers in a different geography outside Australia or even, you know, trying to go from East Coast to, you know, the WA market. Um, and I think a good company for that over the years, uh, Oh, and I know we've chatted about him before. It's been like Energy One. You know, they have bought mm. on little bolt on acquisitions, but which gives them, you know, new products to sell to their, you know, already in installed client base. So like one, they can generate more revenue from their existing customers. And two, they're improving the service that they're providing to their existing customers and making them, you know, stickier because, and now we're using Energy One for okay our core our kind of core energy trading systems, which is what they do our energy trading software. But now we're using them for our contract management. Now we're using them for all our analytics, uh, and, and so on and so on. So it, it actually makes them their customers more entrenched uh, to be with them and, and switching costs higher. So that's something I kind of look for. It doesn't always exist, um, but. You know, where you see acquisitions happening where it's into adjacent businesses and, you know, there's cross-sell opportunities and the ability to do more with existing customers, you know, that's something I really like to see in microcaps because it's it's just going to really build a solid base of customers that, you know, the company can, can leverage off and grow with. Mm. Mm. Yep. And Energy One is a great example. Um, of a company I know you followed for a long time and you gave me the nudge to follow it too um, lots of insider <laughs> ownership um, talk about uh, yeah alignment um, Andrew what would be your number two mate so um, I mean look at the end of the day small caps are exciting but they're they're either moving into an entirely new area or they're moving they're moving into an area to try and take on incumbents. And if you're going to be a very small company, a David and Goliath kind of situation, you know, taking on a big company, you need to have some what might be called counter positioning. What is it that's going to give you the thing to allow you to, to disrupt this market to to capture market share because you will be outgunned by the resources and capital uh, intensity that that the incumbents are able to play. So a really great example here, I want to know we've talked about this one a lot before is with Pointera. So I mean, they basically created an entirely new market. Things were just done differently uh, in that space until these guys came along. So there's you can see it's not about them having to um, 
you know, destroy any other competition. There is no other competition. It's a really, really tiny sort of niche at this point in time anyway. And, and I want to see that that gives me the confidence that they're going to actually have a long-term future of strong growth. If it might be a, like, often you see like, um, another example might be a, a, a telco, a, a small, tiny telco that's come onto the ASX. And what's hard there is that what you're offering is not exactly new in any way, shape or form. You might have more efficient systems. You might have a slightly more customer focus. And some players in this space have done very well. But you've got to say, where's your edge? What is it that's going to allow you to to capture and win in this market to a meaningful degree? Um, and it's if, if they don't have something special like that, I think it's, it's always going to be an uphill battle. I think um, just to come back on uh, what Andrew was saying there, um, I read over Christmas uh, Peter Thiel's books, um, Zero to One. And uh, one of the great points he, he makes in that book is exactly what Andrew is saying. Um, you know, for disruptive businesses or to be a true disruptor, you know, he says you got to, um, you know, be doing, uh, offering the service like 10 times cheaper or it has to be yeah. 10 times better. You know, it has to be that 10x to really get people across. And, you know, one business I think they've done that, you know, I used to be an accountant uh, at one stage hmm. and literally even to this day, any accountants I talk to, and I know lots of them um, from like doing my training and qualifying and all that, you still won't find an accountant who doesn't rave about zero, even now. Hmm. And when it first came and people like accountants started using it, like literally, they were like blown away by like how good it was compared to anything that they had systems that they had previously used before. And still today, I, anytime I talk to them, they're like, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like how good it, and especially if you were, if you are an accountant you're, and especially if you're, your ordinary everyday accountant who's dealing with, you know, small businesses, uh, freelancers, individuals, you know, that, that kind of market, which is, you know, their core market, you know, any accountant I still talk to today still loves the zero set up and system and ecosystem that they've built around it with, with apps, you know, taking the, I guess, the, the ecosystem approach around their core system. And um, so, you know, that's, uh, I think, you know, yeah. what Andrew was saying there, or point here, you know, it, it's got to be that kind of 10x one way or the other or in some form to really, to really mm-hmm. not um, get swallowed up or squashed by the large incumbents in the space. And that's especially true in small caps, right? Like these are rare, these businesses. Yeah. Um, but if you can find them, then, no, I mean, it's great. It's like a gold mine. So um, it's it's a fascinating point. And it's um, it's one way I find that you got to just turn over so, so many rocks to find, find these opportunities. Um, Mark, maybe throw it to you, mate. Um, what would be, do you have like a number three or something else that you look for um, day to day when you're, when you're studying these small companies? You know, and another one that I, you know, generally tend to look at and it, you know, it might seem a bit obvious, but um, is, you know, the level of insider ownership, but with a caveat mm-hmm. that, you know, sometimes you can have too much insider ownership. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, they always rave about insider ownership. But, you know, sometimes you can have too much and, you know, the the management are running it to perfectly execute their incentives, whatever that might be. Um, but it mightn't align up with what, like, is in the best interest of minority shareholders. So, you know, I, I think, you know, always better to have insider ownership than not. But I don't see it as like a panacea that, you know, management's incentives are going to be totally aligned with mm. or these large insiders are going to be totally aligned with what the minority shareholders, um, I guess, uh, needs and wants are going to be. Um, so I do look at insider ownership, but like over the years, I've, you know, kind of down, not downgraded, but I... I I'm a bit more circumspect when I see, you know, really large um, insider ownership compared to, you know, I, I think the sweet spot for me I've found over the years is, you know, let's say board management all add up to, you know, between like 15 and 30% of the, uh, of the insider. I find like that's a very nice sweet spot for, for insider ownership. And another thing I always look at is insider ownership on the board. Like how much of the board 
actually own stock in the company or is there like a couple of directors there and they don't own a single share i'm like you know you're making decisions mm-hmm. that are going to affect you know minority retail shareholders and it has no impact on your um, back pocket and again there i like to see a shareholding where the, the independent directors it's like three to five times their like whatever their board fees so let's say their board fees are you know 40 to 60 grand a year you know i'm expecting them to have quarter of a million 300,000 invest in this company so you know they're quite focused at the board level you know when they're making a decision because it's going to you know really impact like their net wealth but when i see boards with like minimal you know a token 5,000 uh, shares here you know that that to me is like a, a bit of a bit of a amber light in terms of well you know are they really thinking about minority shareholders when they're making decisions at a board level that's an interesting point. Yeah. One, one thing I'll just add on that in terms of a bit of an adjacency. And, and Owen, you mentioned E-Road before. I think from memory, it's like insider ownership is 60% of that business. And, yeah, and so another another sort of wrinkle to consider there is it means that it's what, uh, what people call the free float, the amount of shares that really are, are sort of available for trading on the market, where uh, unlike a lot of insider shares, which tend to be locked up and there's certain trading rules around it. So it's not in and of itself a negative from that perspective, other than just be aware that it tends to exaggerate moves and enhance volatility. So in other words, it doesn't take a lot of volume to go through the market to really swing that around. In fact, that's exactly what we saw with Eero. It sort of came onto the radar and flew up massively, slightly disappointing results from the US and it flew all the way down. I would I would wager if the free float was a lot larger, it would it would probably have been a less extreme move. Uh, on that liquidity thing, I mean that was also uh, just to go back to Energy One EOL, you know, that was also true in EOL. And, you know, they were very clever about how they actually improved the free flow over time doing, you know, underwritten DRP plans, you know, over the course of, I don't know, and how would you say about the last three years or or something like that. And, you know, they've generally, you know, they've improved the, the, the free float and, and got the got the benefit out of it. Um, and sometimes, mm-hmm. yeah, that really tight um, float can actually negatively affect, you know, getting a, I guess a fair market valuation because there's just not enough trading there to do kind of proper price discovery. Um, but it can be managed and it can be, you know, it can be uh, improved over time with a couple of, uh, you know, smart strategies or, you know, strategic sell downs or, you know, wh- whatever it might be. Um, mm. But it, it's, it's definitely something, you know, these big high insider ownerships, um, it it looks great on paper, but you know, in my experience, you, you got to take a more nuanced or uh, context of of what it means in the broader broader sense when you see it. You know, but it actually just not to go on too much yeah. about this point, but it, it it's actually something that prevents a lot of fund managers from playing in these in with these companies because they just they don't meet. Um, those requirements. In fact, I believe for certain indices like the S&P ASX 200 and others, there are a certain requirements in terms of the free float, where if it's too tightly held, they just they just don't qualify, even though on market cap and other metrics, they, they might be able to. So yeah, definitely a consideration. Mm. Yeah, that's um, one of the things that you notice. So when you do funds management research, Mark will probably be familiar with this. Uh, one of the things is you get like, days to exit. So you know if you had to if the fund manager had to liquidate positions to meet redemptions, what would that look like in terms of the profile? And that's one of the things that researchers look at. And so funds are scrutinized if they take too long to exit positions. Um, Andrew, I know you've got one more. Speaking of high insider ownership, I feel like we've talked about this, but just about every time you and I have come into contact uh, this company, but um, it's an interesting point you make um, about this business too. So I'll just throw it over to you. Well, look, it, it's um, we should play a drinking game with this, and every time it's mentioned, we, we have a beer. Um, we, we'd be we, we'd be alcoholics before you know it. But um, the, the company, of course, is is Prometicus. It's something that we've crapped on about for years and years and years. But it just it meets it, it illustrates the point really nicely. And the point I want to make is that when you're looking at small caps, you want a good ability to scale, which we've kind of touched on with, during this conversation. But that is, it's this idea that the company can grow rapidly without having to uh, reinvest a bunch of, of new capital. And the reason I raised uh, ProMedicus as an example here, because it's just a masterclass in how this is done. So it is one of the sexy super stories uh, of the last five years or so. Um, 
uh, their, their top line is growing at such insane amounts. But unlike so many other tech, technology companies, these guys are profitable. Heck, these guys pay a dividend. 60% of the profits they make get put out in dividends. That's a huge payout ratio for a company that's in a hyper growth phase of its life. The share count for Prometicus is flat over 10 years. Or, you know, maybe it's up 0.3 of a percent or something like that. So, so they have not only grown that top line, but as they've been grown that top line, their net margins are just exploding. Um, because there's no dilution, it is translating all into an underpinning of an increased uh, share price. And you're getting dividends, actual cash flow out of this at the same time. Now, you contrast that with other growth companies. And we touched on this before, where the top line is growing, but the, the, the costs are just exploding. Um, you know, there's nothing happening in terms of net margins. They're constantly requiring to do capital raises, et cetera, et cetera. So you want an ability to scale. Frankly, this is why tech companies have become um, so popular, I think, in, in recent times is because the not that all of them will, but in on paper and in theory, a lot of them have a wonderful uh, ability to scale because there's a zero uh, uh, incremental cost for every new customer. So if I go on, if Facebook adds 10,000 new users next month, there's no cost in that. The server costs and that are essentially the same. So you don't have to apply that lens just to technology companies, but you want to you want to ask yourself how much can this company grow before it really has to start making significant investment? What are the gross margins at play? What's the operating cost base of this business, and and how, what kind of growth can that sustain? I think it's really important to look at. One of the criticisms of Prometicus for so long is is how can it play in the vendor um, archive. Market and how can it play in the radiology sector when there's these, you know, companies worth tens of billions of dollars that have budgets that far exceed it, and um, they have you know they spend X amount on R and D every year. How can they possibly compete and be sustainable? Um, when I interviewed Sam Hubert, co-founder, he said um, we've made a point over our entire journey to hire good people, not many people. Yeah. Um, but it's so hard to do that from the outside, isn't it? Like it's yeah. how do you judge? how effective your R&D is going to be in advance. Yes. It's, it's well, hard. I'd also argue with ProMedicus is that it comes back to that point I made in terms of um, counter positioning. They were, they were um, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating area where you, you have these situations where the incumbents can't compete against you because competing against you will mean undermining their existing business model. So they're in this horrible situation where it's mm -hmm. like, we completely pull, the, pull the, the floor away from our existing business model and just accept that it is dead and we start competing with these guys. Or oh, we've probably got another 10 or 15 years where we can milk this for as much uh, as we possibly can. Look at Kodak and the digital camera. Right, like they knew that their business was destroyed. The, the new, the new players in that completely counter positioned towards them, and I think that that's what's happened with um, Prometic is the very nature, the very methodology that they they approach in solving the problem is so at odds with the existing players that they would have to ex essentially throw their existing business in the bin, and none of them were prepared to do that. So it was it was all of these things: an ability to scale, counter positioning great management, good insider ownership. All of the things that we've discussed here today probably apply to ProMedicus in some way, shape or form. So in, in, in that regard, is it, any, is it any surprise that it has performed as well as it has? Mm. I'm not a buyer at current levels, just for- And a great uh, turnaround story as well, Andrew. When you know Sam left the business, kind of lost its way a bit, Sam comes back in. And you know since Sam, I guess- has done as Steve Jobs and come back in for the second time. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just been a, it's been a, it's been, it's been a monster uh, since he like rejoined the business. Yep. Um, yep. So you know, that's another thing. You know, turnarounds and microcaps. That's another a whole thing we could look at. Is um, you know, I I love to look at the the fallen angel IPOs. You know, where they come on. There's a flurry of excitement. They like miss Thank the you. first one or two, and then you know they get absolutely. You know, slaughtered and people just like write them off, and maybe they drift in the wilderness for like a year or two or three years. And you know, a new management team comes up, or the founders come back in, like with Sam. And you know, the mm. actual because it's been off everybody's radar for so long, you know, you can uh, you can get back in there. And I mean, one of the great, I guess, new management teams uh, coming in and kind of reviving a business and going on to do great things is. Um, you know, the guys that connect, you know, when they got in there. And I mean, that was literally a private investor 
taking over the the business because he wasn't happy with the the way it was being run. I'm talking about Damien Banks now, mm. uh, and you know exited with a takeover offer that turned into a bidding war, and you know for so long it was off everybody's radar. But you know it it, it, it was a, another great story of of uh, you know a microcap where you know you can get new management in there and it can completely like change the fortune of a, of a company. I was just going to say what's also interesting about those fallen angels from IPOs is you get rid of a lot of the speculative money. So there's a lot of people who sort of pile in, you know, for the stag and all the rest of it. They lose patience. They go away. You actually end up with a better register overall as well. And if you've particularly got new management that's stepped in or stepped back in, and these are people who know the business intimately well, I, I think that is a very interesting uh, area to look at. Gents, I've got one more which I might throw over um, at you both, which is, um, again, this is kind of something we talk about these things. It's just like one ca- one point, right? Um, like in our process internally, we have 43 different things on a checklist that we look at. And it's not even within those. It's not just one thing. Um, but if I could just throw one more at you guys, we'd just be looking at businesses with wide gross margins. But there is a big asterisk that's sitting next to this. When you use most, as you guys know, when you look at most data providers, um, they'll provide metrics like gross margins, EBITDA, ratios, et cetera. Um, and they have a certain methodology to calculate those things. Mm. But I think there's no um, there's no two ways about it. You kind of have to do it yourself. And so oftentimes, for example, there were companies yesterday that we were looking at um, where it said the gross margin was 10% or 20%. When you look at it and you do the numbers yourself, it's more like 50 or 60% because you actually have a better appreciation for what the business actually does. And so, um, but then there, then there can be some things that are just a bit unusual too. Like we, we, we Andrew, you and I have spoken about this company before, our city and uh, from the ASX is a healthcare med tech company. Um, we're just looking off air, Catherine and I, and um, they, they include like sales and commissions in the, the cost of sales uh, function, mm. which is, again, like you as an analyst, you have to kind of run your own rule over that and, and determine if that's reasonable or not. Um, but yeah, wide gross margins are good in my opinion and f- favorable for most companies because if they do have the high revenue growth, organic revenue growth plus wider gross margins, it can mean that that inflection point is coming sooner rather than later. So that's something that I do I do tend to take a look at and I, and I do do it myself. Um, as you can see, guys, I'm a bit more growth focused in some of my, my picks today. Yeah, uh, we love a bit of growth, mate. Oh, look, I, I I totally agree with you there. I, the one the one thing I would add to that would be so it comes back. I mean, a lot of these a lot of these points overlap, and it, it that wide gross margin is absolutely um, a very attractive thing to look at, particularly if it is legitimate. But on top of that, you want you want that um, that stable uh, operating cost base for that for those that growing revenue and high gross margins to work its magic on uh, as well. That's, that's, that's the other thing you need to look at in tandem with that. But it is a beautiful thing because so much of it just drips like beautiful hot butter to the bottom line, you know, for every new dollar of sales, you're keeping 80% of it or something like that. That is, that is pretty attractive. And that, that leads to some pretty phenomenal operating leverage. Yeah. I mean, I would, I, I would just say on that. Yeah. I mean, you know, high gross margins are great. And I mean, you look at the software businesses and, you know, they're up in the, up in the, up in the eighties um, for a lot of them. So that's, that also makes them like very attractive. And, you know, the, the, the micro cap space, unfortunately, you know, screening uh, as uh, probably you just, the, just discovered, you know, it, it doesn't really work in micro caps. No. I mean, I find the like quality of data when you run screens, mm. You know, sometimes I run a screen and I know this company pays a dividend and according to the screen, you know, it's not part of the universe. It's like it, it just like drops out. I mean, I can even some of the times I look at, you know, the ASX website, it's something as simple as this. The ASX website will tell you the market cap is this. Yahoo Finance will tell you it's this. You know, Google will tell you the, the market cap is this. So, you know, they, they, you know, you can look at three different websites and they'll all tell you, you know, different market caps yeah. and like. They, not by just like, you know, 100,000, you know, it can be out by five or six million. And when you're talking about an $8 million hmm. dollar, you know, macro cap company, you know, that suddenly throws out all your like valuation metrics. Um, so, yeah, I think screens and micro caps. Um, I, I 100% agree with that. So we, we I'm not going to mention the name because I'm not going to say anything too favorable, but we use one of the very big global providers for our data. And the amount of times that we find blatant holes in that is 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 really really scary 
But it's also the other point I would make on top of that as well. Often I think investors feel as though they need some very expensive bit of software and all these kinds of tools. I, I, honestly, if you've got the internet and you can go and um, to the ASX and download the company announcements itself, everything you need is there and you can rely on it and you can carve it up in a way that is meaningful and, and sensible uh, to you. Um, and and you'll, you'll just actually learn a lot of skills and become a better investor along the way. So there's there's a lot of powerful tools out there that purport to do a lot of good things, but there is no replacement for just for just going back to the source material. I think I think there's a lot of value there. It's a great way to put a bow on this conversation. We um we've spoken now for about forty five minutes. Andrew Page, Mark Tobin from Coffee Micro Caps. Um, Mark, uh, it's always a pleasure to have him on the show. You can reach him at coffeemicrocaps.com and you can follow him on Twitter. I'll put all the stuff, all the links in the show notes, so check those out. Andrew, as always, mate, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Strawman.com, where else can people get in contact with you? Yeah, just go to strawman.com. I've, I've really been, I've got to pick up my game on Twitter. I've been really quiet there lately. Um, but uh, sage underscore Simeon uh, is the handle. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's a good place to connect as well. 